Members would kindly remove audible conversation so the committee can continue its work through this bill. Chair asks that members clear the well, clear the aisles. Are there other amendments to this section of the bill? For what purpose, gentlemen from Washington rise? Words. Gentlemen recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise for just a few comments in strong opposition. The gentleman yield. Yes. It's Mr. Chairman, General just suspend. for case. Thank you, sir. I want to thank Mr. Dix for his continuing assistance. Gentlemen will suspend. Right now. Chair requests that members and staff in all the aisles remove audible conversation. From Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise to ask what happened to the party of Teddy Roosevelt? What happened to the party that helped us adopt, under Richard Nixon's leadership, the Clean Air Act? What happened to the Republican Party that used to be allied in the adoption of the clean air rules that have so helped the health of Americans? What happened to the party? that adopted the Clean Air Act 40 years ago, which has helped save over 200,000 lives. And I ask why today, in this continuing resolution, the Republican Party has abandoned any pretext whatsoever to stand for clean air when they eviscerate the clean air law in their continuing resolution. And this is a sad statement to think that a party that at one time helped us clean up the air in reducing cancer deaths, in reducing respiratory ailments, in reducing heart attacks, has seen fit to go in league with the polluting industries to gut the Clean Air Act. Now, I want to make clear so people know what the Republican continuing resolution does. Even though the Clean Air Act today requires the Environmental Protection Agency to clean up our air against dangerous gases like carbon dioxide and ozone, even though the Supreme Court has ruled that Americans are entitled to this protection, the Republican Party has decided to make it illegal for the cops on the beat to do their job. This bill, amazingly enough, the Republicans have passed a provision or want to in this bill that would make it illegal for the Environmental Protection Agency to protect the environment. Now, why would you want to make it illegal for an Environmental Protection Agency to protect the environment? And I want to make clear how radical this action is. There's no fiscal reason for this. This is just an assault on clean air. The Dirty Air Act is not going to revise any proposed rules of the Environmental Protection Agency. It isn't going to modify any clean air laws. It's going to eliminate them by saying that it's illegal for the EPA to enforce these clean air laws. And the sad thing about this, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, this is an assault 
on science. You know, you read the specific scientific conclusion of the thousands of scientists who have reviewed this. And the, here's what the scientists and the physicians say. Mr. Chairman, not the politicians, the physicians. Here's what they say. Greenhouse gases are the primary driver of climate change, which can lead to hotter, longer heat waves that threaten the health of the sick, poor, or elderly. Increases in ground level ozone pollution linked to asthma and other respiratory illnesses, as well as other threats to the health and welfare of Americans. Close quote. Now, why would the Republican Party want to make the air more dangerous for our kids who are using those inhalers to try to prevent asthma attacks? You know, in our Commerce Committee hearing, we had a young woman from North Carolina. And she talked about the fact that increasing ozone increases and aggravates her asthma. What reason in this green earth do we have to increase the rates of asthma of our kids? And that's what the Republican Party wants to do in this continuing resolution. Now, that's kind of a harsh statement. It's a harsh statement to say that one of our noble parties wants to increase the availability of ozone to damage our kids' health. But facts are stubborn things. And this is what the Republican Party is sentencing our kids to, which is more dangerous air. And it's a real sad statement when you consider the past history of the Republican Party, which helped, under Richard Nixon and Teddy Roosevelt, adopt these environmental laws. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope that at some point we will get a little more bipartisanship here for clean air. We will abandon this commitment to the polluting industries that are running this effort and reject this continuing resolution and these anti-clean air laws. Yield back. The time the gentleman has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from North Carolina recognize? I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we are debating amendments on a continuing resolution because the leadership of the 100th and 11th Congress failed to do one of their most basic jobs last year, pass a budget to fund the federal government. Left without a budget to work with and our financial house in shambles, it's clear that we are in a state of financial crisis. Our, de our debt requires immediate action, and this CR is just the beginning. I came to Congress because, like many other new re Republican members of the freshman class, I run a small business, sticking to my budget and trying to make plans for the future. All the while, I was watching Washington politicians drive this country's economy into a ditch. I knew that something had to change. My friends on the other side of the aisle are trying all the same worn-out tricks but I'm here to say the American people, to the American people, this is not about tricks or politics. This is about preserving the greatness of America. No one in this chamber finds joy in the tough decisions we have to make, but we can no longer ignore them. The American people have elected this Congress to be good stewards of their money. Today is not a happy day. This is not a happy speech. Government spending and burdensome regulations have driven the American people to anger and frustration with good reason. Sadly, our nation stands on the edge of bankruptcy. Our love for future generations of Americans requires that we not ignore today's problems, only to find them years from now in irreparable financial ruin. Regardless of the program, today's deficit spending is tomorrow's tax increase. In my neighborhood, there have been three babies born recently. Each of those baby babies now owe $45,000 in federal debt. We are fighting for our very survival. At risk are the freedoms representative of a free market economy and free society, the freedom to choose, freedom of private industry to compete, freedom from burdensome taxation, and freedom from mandated government programs.
Washington today is slowly smothering the personal liberty Americans so greatly esteem. As the 112th Congress struggles to pass legislation that meets our nation's current challenges, fundamental disagreement remains. Unfortunately for the American people, the debate is being framed by my colleagues on the other side as vicious cuts, vital programs by Republicans who simply don't care. Hear me now when I say this has never been farther from the truth. Today we come to terms with the fact that we cannot spend money on everything we want, regardless of the good intention. For years, politicians have ignored these problems. Not this Congress, not this Congresswoman. The people elected us to end the talk and take swift action, and we must. As a small business owner, when finances get tight, we cut where necessary. Raising prices isn't always the option. As painful as it, is, as it may be, you make tough decisions to cut waste, operations, production costs, and eventually jobs as a last resort. Why should the federal government be any different? Today's debt crisis is a very real threat to our liberty. Liberty allows people to work hard and achieve what they want, be responsible for their own actions, and be free. No one shackled by debt is free. Today's budget crisis is dangerous and threatens our basic freedoms. Free societies value every citizen equally, placing no preference one over another. I believe that no one should be entitled to another's hard-earned provisions and that government should support its citizens, not burden some, them with uh, encumbersome debt and obligations they cannot fulfill. Government spending is not the answer to our looming problems. I know there will be those who argue that my rhetoric is too harsh and that the financial crisis is not as bad as it seems. This crisis is real, and without immediate action, America will continue spiraling toward financial disaster. Today, I challenge my colleagues to let real leadership begin. No longer should we turn to China to finance that which we cannot afford. Let us have the courage to right our wrongs, the strength to see it through, and the vision to lead with the powers entrusted to us from the consent of the governed rather than selfish ambition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? To strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise to oppose this bill and the priorities and the values it represents. Uh, Republicans repeat like robots the same talking points we've heard again and again tonight, that to get our debt under control, middle-class families are going to have to suck it up. Uh, we, hate, we face tough choices, harsh choices, but really there is no choice. We're going to have to cut public education drastically, along with Head Start for the children who otherwise would start kindergarten too far behind ever to catch up, job training for workers who've lost their jobs, Pell Grants for, so middle-class kids can, can afford a college education, research at the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and on and on. Mr. Speaker, we do have choices. We have this deficit because of choices we've made. Just a decade ago, the debate here was what to do with the surplus. Alan Greenspan, who was then the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, worried that it might unsettle the economy if we paid off the national debt too quickly. President Clinton urged that we use the surplus to shore up Social Security and Medicare so that my generation could live in dignity when we retire. A Republican president and a Republican Congress decided instead to cut taxes sharply for the richest of the rich. The deficit we face now is because of that choice. Uh, and we saw just two months ago that protecting those tax cuts for the richest of the rich, even Americans making more than a million dollars a year, was their first priority. So despite all of the weeping and wailing, the gnashing of teeth, the rending of garments about the deficit now, just two months ago, they said not a word about the deficit when they were voting to cut taxes to explode the deficit by cutting taxes on the very richest Americans. So now Congress is voting to cut, to kick 200,000 kids out of Head Start so that Americans who worked and strived to be conceived to the right parents uh, will have to pay little in inheritance taxes. Now Congress is voting to fire 17,000 teachers and special educators 
So Americans making more than a million dollars a year will not have to pay the income taxes that they paid in the 90s, which was hardly a confiscatory rate. And much of the bill obviously has nothing to do with saving money or whether the government's too big or too small. It's about whose side the government is on. This bill cuts drastically the funding, the funding needed to protect middle class families from the gouging that has lurked in the legalese, the fine print of financial contracts, the tricks and the traps written by banks' lawyers. That cut has nothing to do with saving money. It is all about putting government on the side of financial predators, not on the side of hardworking, honest Americans trying to make an honest living. We've seen clusters of, of rare cancers and birth defects that we know are the result of an environmental exposure to something, and this bill devastates environmental protection. Middle class children are facing life with, a, with lower IQs because of unchecked environmental exposure so polluters can have bigger profits and CEOs can, can reward themselves with bigger bonuses. Many of my colleagues have argued that this bill is penny wise and pound foolish. It is short sighted. It will hurt the economy. All of that is true. But I am most disturbed that this bill represents values that are incompatible with the values I learned at my mother's knee, the values of generations of Americans, the values of the faith traditions of most Americans, including me, the values that have been the glue that has held our country together in tough times. I will vote no. I yield back. Chairman Neal's back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida rise? I rise to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I'm totally opposed to this resolution. I knew back in December when Congress cut taxes for millionaires and billionaires that in February we would be cutting service for the working poor, children, and the disabled. The House Republican CR, in fact, is very similar to the last December tax cut bill, which included billions of dollars in tax breaks for the wealthiest 2% of Americans, while driving up the budget deficit an extra $700 billion. The proposed continuing resolution will, as what I usually call reverse Robin Hood, will rob from the poor and, work, and working people to give tax breaks to the rich. In my area of specialization, transportation and infrastructure, this bill would rescind $2.5 billion for high-speed rail projects already awarded, as well as cancellation of 76 transportation projects in 40 states, bringing about a loss of 25 new construction jobs, pink slips. While the unemployment rate is still 9% in our nation, it is critical to invest in infrastructure at this time. As I always said, Federal Transportation and Infrastructure Fund is essential to job creation. And for every $1 billion invested in infrastructure projects, over 42,000 well-paid permanent jobs are created and over $2 billion in economic development. This resolution also cut programs to assist homeless vets. Over 130,000 of our nation's 24 million veterans are homeless at any given night. In this time of foreclosure and uncertainty in the housing market, it is inconceivable that we would limit the help available to those who serve and protect our country, freedom, as we hold so dear. Uh, so we're going to give pink slips to over 130,000 veterans. I want to say that that will not happen, but paint slip to the veterans. In addition, over 200,000 children, we're going to kick off of Head Start, a paint slip for the Head Start program, reduce the maximum per Pell Grant, 800,000 per student, take away over 20,000 research support at the National Foundation, and a program that is near and dear to my heart, over 1,300 cops off the beat. This program was started under President Clinton, where we put an additional 100,000 cops on the beat and cut down crime. We cut another 2,400 firefighters, 
paint slips for the firefighters, and a cut $2.5 billion in the National Institute of Health. Budget decisions by Congress and the President should prioritize the most needy communities who are struggling to make end meet at this difficult economic time, not the wealthy and the powerful. Today's bill on the House floor does absolutely nothing to create jobs or improve our nation economy, but is in a direct assault on the most vulnerable by cutting the budget in every single area from transportation to our nation veterans to our nation's children to police on the beat protecting our system. Once again, the Republican Party is asking our seniors, our students, our children, and working families to make fiscal sacrifices while millionaires and billionaires and powerful special interest groups get to walk off without a stretch. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Generator yields back. If there are no further amendments to this section, the clerk will read. Page 276, line 12, section 1747. None of the funds made available may be used by the Environmental Protection Agency to force a change to a rule or guidance pertaining to the definition of waters under the jurisdiction of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Section 1748, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, Forest and Rangeland Re Research, two million $297,252,000. Section 1749, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, State and Private Forestry, $232,680,000. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. It's number 85. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 85, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Pompeo of Kansas. The gentleman from Kansas is recognized for five minutes on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise to offer an amendment that will reduce spending for the Interna International Forestry Program by $7.4 million. Uh, some on the other side have said $7.4 million isn't very much money when we have a deficit of a little over $1.5 trillion. In Kansas, that's still a little bit of money. Uh, this program started out a long time ago uh, to provide funds for saving the Brazilian rainforest. But like so many programs that had good intentions, uh, it's morphed. It's morphed into something terribly different. Uh, just this past year, uh, this program funded field trips for students in Mexico uh, to follow the migration of monarch butterflies. It funded research in China uh, to protect panda habitat and make sure that we didn't have the infestation of forest pests in China. And I think the Chinese can fund that themselves if someone thinks that's a a worthy task. Last year, it funded the International Forestry, the International Forestry Program, funded a study on declining hummingbird populations in the western United States, Canada, and Mexico. Mr. Chairman, there are difficult decisions to make uh, when the country is at this point in its economic life, uh, but this is not difficult. These are precisely the kind of programs that Americans sent a new Congress to take care of, uh, to make sure that we're not doing things that make no sense for America. So I'd urge support for this amendment. Chairman yields back. back. What purpose, gentlemen from Virginia, rise? Mr. Chairman, I strike. I rise to strike the requisite number of words. Gentlemen's recognized for Mr. Five Chairman, I, I yield to Ms. McCollum from Minnesota to explain why the Democrats on the subcommittee are very strongly opposed to this amendment. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to make it clear that while the congressman says the amendment eliminates the U.S. Forest Service international programs, it does not. The amendment only calls for a reduction in the budget of the Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, State, and Private Forest. Should this short-sighted amendment pass, the agency would decide what to cut within this budget. That being said, the gentleman from Kansas is unfairly maligned, an important agency that's doing unsung work. The U.S. Forest Service international programs play a unique role as one of the few federal agencies working with international governments and NGOs, too. One, stop the flow of illegal wood that is undercutting our U.S. timber industry and costing us jobs. Another example, protecting Canada's western boreal forest in partnership with Ducks Unlimited to ensure future generations of hunters will have access to waterfall habitat. 
This area is the second most productive breeding ground for ducks that migrate to the United States. The examples of working with China and Russia are important. Working with China and Russia to, ad to address such invasive species as emerald ash borer and the Asian gypsy moth, both of which currently are threatening millions of forest acres in my home state of Minnesota and have devastated parts of the eastern part of the United States. Similarly, all wildlife salmon migrate from the rivers of the west coast of North America to eastern Russia to the Pacific Ocean. The Forest Service is working with the Russians to improve the watershed management on these rivers in eastern Russia to preserve the wild stock of this important species for future generations. But one of the things that disturbs me most is the way that a program has been described that allows students to interact with one another and learn about forestry management, biology, and how we are interconnected in this world. There are no Mexican students that go on field trips here in the United States, but there is an exchange of classrooms in Canada and the United States and in Mexico where teachers online follow the migration of the monarch. Students learn about, yes, insects. They learn about the trees that are important to them, and they learn biology. These are very, very important programs. They should not be maligned. And this amendment, while it does not eliminate the program, should still be opposed. With that, I yield back. Jim, Jim. I would uh, associate myself uh, strongly with the remarks of the gentlelady from Minnesota and strongly urge rejection of this amendment. Thank you. Chairman yields back. For what purpose, gentleman from Idaho, rise? Strike the last word. Gentleman, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to this amendment. The international forestry program has already been reduced by 25 percent in this proposal. It's funded at $7.4 million in the CR. In FY10, it was funded at $9 million. Uh, the international program brought in an additional $36 million in funds from state and USAID. Uh, the international program brings in approximately $3 for every dollar invested. This program, regardless of the amount of money it spends. It's still a lot of money just in, in Idaho, just as it is in Kansas. But this program is critical to protecting forestry and forest products industry in the United States. It's the only, forest, it's the only forestry entity representing the U.S. at trade summits. International forestry is the only program working directly to counter the flow of illegally harvested forest products abroad. These materials compete with legally and sustainably harvest, harvested U.S. forest products. U.S. negotiators from the Department of State, the U.S. trade representatives uh, rely on the international program to provide technical input to effectively advocate for the domestic forest products industry. These agencies do not have this expertise. The international program also prevents the introduction of invasive and non-native pests that would cause millions of dollars of damage to U.S. forests and the U.S. economy. The international program, though funded through funding from USAID plays a critical role in protecting U.S. security interests in conflict-prone areas. Unrelated, illegal resource extraction many times leads to the unrest and corruption abroad. So I would oppose this amendment, even though I understand that the gentleman, uh, it's easy to go after international programs when we have such problems here. The fact is, is that they protect industry here in this country, in the U.S. forest products industry in this country, because as I said, they're the only ones representing the U.S. forest products industry and forestry in general in international trade agreements. So I would oppose this amendment and hope that my colleagues would also, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Kansas. Those in favor of the amendment will say aye. Those opposed will say no. No. Okay, the chair, the noes have it. For what purpose, gentleman from Kansas, rise? Uh, to request a uh, recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Kansas will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 277, line 10, section 1750, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, National Forest System, $1,525,339,000. Section 1751, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, Capital Improvement and Maintenance, $495,409,000. Section 1752, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, Land Acquisition, $9,100,000. Section 
Section 1753, the level for Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, Wildland Fire Management, $1,978,737,000. Section 1754, the authority provided by Section 337 of the Department of the Interior and Related Agencies Appropriations Act 2005 as amended. Section 1755, the level for Department of Health and Human Services, Indian Health Service, Indian Health Services, $3,883,886,000. Section 1756, the level for Department of Health and Human Services, Indian Health Service, Indian Health Facilities, $255,497,000. Section 1757, the level for Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, $77,546,000. Section 1758, the level for Department of Health and Human Services, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, Toxic Substances and Environmental Public Health, $74,039,000. Section 1759, the level for Executive Office of the President, Council on Environmental Quality and Office of Environmental Quality, $2,848,000. Section 1760, the level for Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, Salaries and Expenses, $10,799,000. Mr. Chairman. What purpose, gentleman from Idaho, I ask unanimous consent that the remainder of the bill through page 281, line 17, be considered read, uh, printed in the record, and open to amendment at any point. Is there objection? That objection is so ordered. Are there amendments to this portion of the bill? If not, the clerk will read. Section 1768, the level for National Foundation on the Arts and the human, Humanities National Endowment, Endowment for the Arts, Grants and Administration, $145 million. For what purpose, gentlemen from Minnesota, rise? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have, from Michigan. Amendment, I have amendment at the desk, number 196. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 196, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Currently, the uh, continuing resolution funds the National Endowment for the Arts at the approximate fiscal year 2008 level of $145 million. Amendment number 196 takes the funding levels back to the fiscal year 2006 levels at $124.4 million. If accepted, this cut returns $20.6 million to the spending reduction account. Though some would call for full defunding of the NEA, I'm not doing that. You see, I believe in the true fine arts, and of course that's defined by individual standards, I understand. I found that fact as the finance chair of a symphony orchestra for a number of years, People will support what they appreciate. However, at a time when our government is in a position where it must cut federal spending, I believe one of the main sources of the funding for the arts needs to be through philanthropy, but that only happens best in a sound and a growing economy. This budget crisis, this economy, continues to be frustrated by the spending of government that frustrates individuals who indeed would be willing to support and in fact still do support the arts as well. The National Foundation for the Arts does provide benefits to our country and helps fund some fine and true arts. However, we are asking them to only fund true priorities. Priorities approved by the majority of taxpayers, of city, citizens, of sponsors and patrons of the arts, and limiting resources sometimes refocuses and defines that focus. We know that the public has had questions on some of the programs that the NEA has supported. Major questions, major concerns. 
attention to those concerns will gain the support of the taxpayer of, as well as the philanthropist. Our country is a financial hardship and we're not taking programs like the NEA off the table. I refer to a letter I received last night from a very strong patron of the arts of the symphony that I served as a finance chair of, a major manufacturer in my district, a chairman of that manufacturing corporation, talking about what they have just gone through as a business. And I just read an excerpt where he says, until today we've been operating under a forbearance agreement that began in 2008. It's been a struggle. Our leadership group accepted 15 to 50 percent cuts in salary, and our hourly staff accepted 10 percent wage reductions. Our salesmen continue to find new opportunities. We reduced our spending tremendously and only spent for essentials. Our belt was very tight. We did all we could to help ourselves, and we all made many sacrifices. Above all, we never stopped believing in our future. That's the type of impact that goes in the private sector that we, even in programs we enjoy, benefit from, and help out on, need to understand. Our country is in financial hardship, and we're not taking programs even like the NEA off the table. I yield back my time. Jimmy is back. For what purpose, gentlemen from Virginia, rise? Uh, I rise in, uh, in op uh, to strike the last word. Gentlemen, is recognized for five minutes. And I will speak in opposition to this amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, NEA is already cut in this continuing resolution by $22 million. The NEA's contribution to deficit reduction is really infinitesimal, but its elimination would not be. It would be very costly. The NEA represents less than one one-hundredth of discretionary spending. The economic dividend this nation receives from the endowment for the arts, however, far exceeds the investment we make. It seems to me that when there are too many issues that divide this nation and there remains too much harshness and rancor, the arts have an even more important role to play because they remain a powerful medium through which we can all transcend our common differences and appreciate beauty, empathize with all of humankind. This is what the arts are all about. This is what NEA enables all Americans to great, more greatly appreciate. The NEA budget is small, but it is such an important catalyst to help create and sustain the arts. Last year, actor Jeff Daniels spoke in an Interior Preparation Subcommittee hearing as to how NEA supported the revival of a theater in his hometown in Michigan. It was, a small, it was a small grant, but in his case, it restored the theater and its productions so that neighboring owners then restored their homes and turned them into bed and breakfast places. Restaurant and antique shops saw a boost in their businesses. And in fact, the state of Michigan just built an exit ramp off the state highway to serve the increasing number of cars flocking to this hometown that otherwise was a virtual ghost town. They are a magnet for businesses every place that they locate. And NEA searches out those opportunities. There are 668,000 businesses involved in the creation and distribution of art and millions of jobs. Just two examples in Virginia. I'll, actually, I'll, to save time, I'll give one example. Signature Theater in Sherlington, Arlington, Virginia received NEA grants for their nationally recognized artistic and education programs. I would suggest that all of our members go there sometime, they will invariably see an extraordinary good performance, one that has generated economic activity throughout that community, and one that could not have gotten on its feet without the help of the National Endowment for the Arts. When you cut that budget, you see a dramatic adverse impact on the national arts community. 
and specifically on arts education programs that are developing throughout community centers and in our schools. We do need to invest in the cultural lives of our citizenry and in our children's future. This is ours could not find it in its heart to provide $167 million for the endowment for the arts. The arts and humanities will survive, but they will not be accessible for the large majority of our citizens who couldn't otherwise afford uh, I I the expensive tickets that too often uh, are charged at those performing arts places where, frankly, the the, the financially elite are only able to uh, afford to go. Uh, what the NEA does is to expand uh, artistic achievement to give people an opportunity to fully appreciate and for us to appreciate that talent. Denise Graves, who grew up in Washington, the Anacostia area, said that the Kennedy Center could have been a world away. She never would have seen it had not it been for a National Endowment for the Arts grant, that enabled her to then pursue a career that, that ultimately uh, resulted in one of the finest uh, operatic performers uh, in America and the world. Uh, the uh, chair of the National Endowment for the Ar Arts, Rocco Landisman, a Broadway producer, extraordinarily effective, active uh, leader, he has suggested reform, that we probably have too many arts venues. Let's consolidate them. Let's make sure that all of them are of the highest quality. It has Gentlemen's started a discussion that needs to be done. But what shouldn't be done is to cut the National Endowment for the Arts uh, even further than this continued resolution does. I would urge rejection of the amendment, Madam Chair. What purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? Uh, I uh, move to strike the requisite number of words and uh, rise in support of the amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. So in opposition to the amendment. Uh, first of all, I, I have been on the committee for a long time, uh, the Interior Appropriations Committee, and I can remember when Sid Yates from Chicago was the uh, ranking, was the, was the chairman, and uh, we had arts funding uh, at about $180 million. And uh, we had the new Republican leadership come in in uh, 1994 and, and uh, 1995. They cut the endowments in half. And what we what, uh, what we found out was that when the when the endowment had less money to give out in grants, the private sector started to give less money uh, for grants and to help these institutions. And I applaud the gentleman for being a leader in his local arts community. The Americans for the Arts did a major study four or five years ago uh, about the economic impact of the arts. And the gentleman from the, the Virginia is absolutely correct. The, the arts have exploded across the country. There are, we have, uh, we have given grants now in almost every single congressional district, which has helped uh, the proliferation of arts institutions. Consolidation it doesn't scare me. I think that would might, in some areas might be a good idea. I've seen in the Puget Sound area, in Seattle and in Tacoma, how much uh, th this has meant to the local communities. And uh, these are very, uh, this is a relatively small amount of money. When I was chairman of the committee, I did increase it, but I never increased it uh, an amount that the, uh, that the, uh, de the Republican uh, ranking member could not also support. So, you know, uh, Rocco Landisman said, well, why didn't you just put up the $250 million? We did this on a bipartisan basis. We also have an arts caucus in the Congress that operates on a bipartisan basis, and we've had on the, vo on the floor over the years a multiple of votes, and we've had, a, you know, 40 or 50 enlightened Republicans who have uh, joined with us and, uh, and made a, a, a good majority in support of, uh, of these programs. And uh, the, the humanities is also extremely important 
uh, literature and, and in education and helping our teachers. Uh, so I think these are worthy programs. I think the committee made the, committee made the right decision here. Uh, I, I wish it was still at 167.5, but they've reduced it down to what, one, about 145. And I think that's good enough. I, I think going further than that will really do damage to both of these endowments who, that have been there since uh, 1965, back in the Johnson administration. And uh, I, I just uh, think this would be a mistake. I support what the committee did, and I think we should stay with that number. Thank you. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York rise? I, I rise to strike the last word. Gentleman's, gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. I, I uh, rise in uh, opposition to this amendment and, and uh, want to state that the arts uh, not only contribute to education and enlightenment, uh, they're important job creators. The NEA contributes uh, to the development and economic growth of communities nationwide, and each year the arts industry generates $166 billion in economic activity and provides 5.7 million full-time jobs. In my district alone, nearly 120,000 people are employed in the museums, theaters, art galleries, and other arts organizations that I'm proud to represent. So this is not the moment for trying to score uh, political points in the name of fiscal responsibility. And uh, we should not be proposing deep cuts that will take effect right away and destroy jobs in the arts and other places at the very time we're trying like mad to create them. This CR threatens our recovery just as the economy is bouncing back from the worst recession in decades and proves that uh, my uh, colleagues on the other side of the, uh, of the aisle are tone deaf to the American people's number one priority which is jobs. Earlier this week, President Obama laid out a budget that makes tough choices, a thoughtful uh, budget that includes a five-year freeze on non-defense discretionary spending and reduces the deficit by $1.1 trillion. It does all of this while making important investments in education, infrastructure, jobs, and our nation's competitiveness investments that will prepare us to compete now and in the future. As the President said at his press conference on Tuesday, when it comes to this budget, we need to use a scalpel, not a machete. The Republicans, by contrast, are making deep, painful, and seemingly arbitrary cuts, cuts that would result in more than 200,000 children being dropped from Head Start, Thousands of teachers would lose their jobs and be forced to leave the classroom. $2.5 billion in NIH cuts would jeopardize critical cancer and other disease research. 1,300 fewer cops would be on the beat as a result of eliminating the cops hiring program, which we restored in a vote on this floor earlier tonight, thankfully. There will be 2,400 fewer firefighters through the elimination of a safer grants which again we fought to restore. Science and energy research to help drive our clean energy economy would be reduced. And the horrible list goes on and on, including this cut that is before us right now. And let's be clear, cutting education, the arts, letting our infrastructure deteriorate further, and, and failing to harness the power of innovation is a recipe for declining competitiveness in an increasingly competitive global economy. It's imperative that we must invest in the future, invest in creating jobs, and this grant to the National Endowment of the, of the Arts is an important investment that will pay dividends years down the road. And uh, I, 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 I uh, strongly support uh, the program and I'm opposed to the gentleman's uh, uh, proposal to cut it. And uh, I, I, I would uh, like to include in the record the rest of my comments, okay. but in the interest of time, Thank yield you. back. Thank you. Gentlewoman yields back. The question is on the amendment. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise?
uh, to request, uh, request a recorded vote. Pursuant to the Clause 6 of Rule 18, for, for further proceedings on the amendment are for, offered by the gentleman from Michigan uh, will be postponed. For what purpose is the gentleman from... No, I'm oh. just, just hoping... Clerk will read. Page 281, line 22, section 1769. The level for National Foundation on the Arts and the Humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities, grants an administration $145 million. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Madam Chairman, um, I have an amendment at the desk preprinted in the record, amendment number 249. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 249, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Conseco of Texas. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> My amendment is very simple. It would eliminate federal funding for the National Capital Arts and Cultural Affairs Grant Program, which the underlying continuing resolution funds at $4.5 million. This program provides non-competitive grant funding for overhead costs to support artistic and cultural programs in the District of Columbia exclusively. In his budget last year and this year, President Obama has requested that this program's funding be cut by 50 percent, which the underlying legislation does. In this year's budget, President Obama notes that, in general, these institutions are also able to apply for federal funding from other sources. I'm not here to debate the merits of the program. I'm not here to question whether or not the money has been used by the institutions to accomplish good things. What I'm here to do today is to debate and question why this program should be considered a priority and receive taxpayer funding when we're in a fiscal crisis. Make no mistake, we are in a fiscal crisis that threatens not only our economy, economic security, but our national security. However, you don't have to take my word for it. Admiral Mike Mullen, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has said, I think that the biggest threat we have to our national security is our debt. Dr. Ada Alice Rivlin, a former Office of Management and Budget Director under President Clinton and member of the President's Deficit Commission, said in testimony before the Senate Budget Committee last February, on any reasonable set of economic assumptions, the U.S. budget is on an unsustainable track. There is no disagreement among the Office of Management and Budget, the Congressional Budget Office, the Government Accountability Office, and leading private forecasters on where the budget is headed if we do not change course. And she continued, the growing deficit will be more and more difficult and expensive to finance. Ultimately, we will not be able to borrow enough to finance the widening gap between spending and revenues. Even before the government spending spree that occurred under President Obama, then Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Harry Reid began, our nation was headed for a day of fiscal reckoning. They simply spent up, sped up the day our nation will hurl, hurdle off the fiscal cliff, increasing non-defense discretionary spending by 84 percent in just two years. Under their leadership, federal spending has risen to levels as a sh to levels as a share of our economy not seen since World War II and resulted in the federal government borrowing approximately 40 cents out of every dollar we spend. Where is all this headed if we don't stop our spending? If you followed the situation that occurred last year in Greece, you know that na that, that nation had to make many painful choices very quickly because it had spent too much and investors were demanding higher interest rates to take on the risk associated with buying Greeks, Greece's debt. If we don't get our fiscal house in order, what occurred in Greece is a preview of events to come to America. If we don't stop the spending and get our fiscal house in order, we will be the first generation of Americans to leave the next generation with a legacy of less freedom and prosperity. Do we want to leave our children and grandchildren a legacy of debt 
and limited opportunity, we have two choices. We can either stop the spending that is driving our fiscal crisis, or we can continue to the spending, uh, continue the spending and one day become a next Greece. Madam Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the, the chair understands the gentleman to offer amendment number 249. The clerk will read into the next paragraph. Section 1770, the level for national capital arts and cultural, uh, cultural affairs, $4,500,000. For what purpose does for what purpose is the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by the gentleman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, this amendment uh, would entirely eliminate funding for a successful proven program. The Capital Arts Program was established in 1986 to fill a substantial funding gap affecting uh, the major private arts groups in the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. It now funds 23 such groups. In every other major city in the United States, major private arts groups receive federal funds from their state arts councils, which frequently have such a major institution's funding category. That, um, that's not particularly important, but uh, 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 those who are involved in arts organizations uh, understand that that's the, w the money they depend upon. In D.C., they don't have that money to depend upon. No similar flow of government funds from any level is available to major arts groups in Washington, D.C. The 23 groups that receive this money employ thousands of people. Outreach efforts to school children is one of the principal things that is funded through this capital arts grant program. Uh, if we didn't have this, uh, the, uh, those outreach programs would be virtually eliminated. The, they constitute almost all of the arts outreach and arts educational programs that are available to children in the D.C. schools and schools in the suburbs. It's a program that has widespread popular support. It's not a lot of money for each organization, but it's essential money to enable them uh, to continue functioning. Uh, the, um, the, f the fact that uh, we're talking about such a small amount of money in the context of uh, such an uh, enormous uh, a deficit, uh, it, it just, uh, it, it really seems wrong that children in our nation's capital would be denied outreach from these arts institutions that uh, are proximate to where they live, but wholly inaccessible without this program. So uh, I, I would urge that uh, we have a heart for the, uh, particularly for the children and the schools in Washington, D.C., reject this amendment and leave this very small amount of money uh, in this Interior Appropriations Bill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? I rise in opposition to the amendment. and. Uh, strike the requisite number Gentleman's of words. Gentleman recognized for five minutes. I, I want to uh, uh, associate myself with uh, the remarks of the uh, ranking member, Mr. Moran. Uh, this is a program that was created because the arts institutions in the District of Columbia, uh, many of them, do not get any support from the District of Columbia government. There's no state government. Uh, in New York, uh, they get money from the city, from the boroughs, from the, from the state government uh, for the major arts institutions. This program was a very modest program that helps 23 uh, performing arts institutions that, which are extremely important, all of which have very solid educational programs that help uh, inner city youth here. Uh, we have a very high population of inner city youth in the District of Columbia. So I, I just think this has been a proven program. Uh, it is very modest. Uh, it's been cut in half. Uh, last year, I think we had it at about $9.5 million. It's been cut in half. Uh, I, I think we should leave that. I think the committees made a decision, and to go further would just be, in my mind, punitive. And I yield back to the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. 
In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Gentleman Madam, from Texas. Madam Chair, I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. Clerk will read. Page 282, line 8, section 1771, the level for Presidio Trust, Presidio Trust Fund, $15 million. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Uh, Madam Chair.